<laughs> Hi everybody, it's Barry Chamish. Um, I'm going to tell you, for those who care, after all this time, boy, my health has just gone downhill. I had a, I guess, a seizure. Whatever I fell, my whole body aches. I'm having a very rough old age. I want you to know that. That said, my guests have to put, you got to be easy on me, folks. Now, look, uh, Martin de la Sengel is the first guest. And, well, he uh, got a pretty good reaction last time uh, he was on. And, uh, Martin, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Barry. Martin, can you, I wanted to focus on one thing to begin with. What is the Frankfurt Main School of Philosophy? The Frankfurt Main School of Philosophy was uh, founded about a um, short time after World War I. And um, mainly there are Jews which are based on, the, on socialist uh, thoughts. Well, let's focus even better on this. I'm interested more on its far background with Shabtai Svi. And, well, first of all, let's start with Shabtai Svi. Yeah. How does his philosophy commingle with the Frankfurt School philosophy? Okay, the Frankfurt School of Philosophy was uh, was was directed by Jews. Um, Are we blaming them? No, no, I'm not blaming them. It's it's um, you know there are two thoughts. One thing is that there was Heidegger. He was he was he was not in Frankfurt. He was in uh, not far away in Freiburg, and. His no, I'm interested ideology. in the way Frankfurt, I want you to know Frankfurt has got to be the conspiracy capital. Yes. I mean, this place is yeah. where everything, yes. well, let's just say that Illuminatiism and, um, well, the original Rothschilds, they all gather. They all come from Frankfurt, yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, and, and there are great names like uh, Max Horkheimer or Herbert Marcuse which come from out of this school of Frankfurt with Max, Mor Max Horkheimer being the director of uh, of, uh, of the Institute for Social Research but uh, all the philosophy was based on Marxism that was that was the center and, and all the thoughts are around this Subject. Well, Marcuse um, influenced, even influenced the family I grew up in. Uh, oh. I don't know what who he was, mm -hmm. uh, what he was doing, but he had an influence on middle class Jews worldwide. Yep, I believe that. Marcuse was uh, he was a student um, of Max Horkheimer. And uh, Marcuse then joined the OSS. The oh, OSS. don't jump there. OSS is American. Yeah, uh, it's American. So Marcuse was... was why did he join he an imported, American... He imported the thoughts of the Frankfurt School to America. Uh, first of all, how did he even... The OSS predated the CIA. It's an, essentially an intelligence agency. Why would he join them? I think he was hired. He was hired um, to 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 base the whole action upon a philosophy, to base the, the worldwide actions of the OSS and later of the CIA upon a philosophy. You know that. Right. Was it yeah. a good philosophy? No, oh, it it was the philosophy of uh, which which was uh, born in the Frankfurt School. Of philosophy, you know, it was what Mark, Max Horkheimer thought to do. It was what uh, before what Marx and Engels thought to to establish. It it sounds quite good in the 
in the ears of men. You know, it's, it's a human philosophy. What man can do, man without God. Well, what can he do without God? What man can do by himself. You know, yes, well, what can he power. do by himself? I no. want to get to the core of what the Frankfurt yeah. School of Philosophy taught. He taught knowledge, knowledge about humans, about men, about about the cooperation of men. You know, it's it's uh, the school of uh, of society. Yeah, how society acts and how to lead the society, how to become a leader in a society. It's you know the the name of the Institute for Social Research is. To, to do research not only in on individuals but on the cooperation of individuals in in society all right that doesn't really sound like Marxism which you're claiming it really was at the core of the philosophy but alrighty no that that uh, continued. Uh, till later, it was even in the 1960s when uh, when uh, the professor in Frankfurt didn't exactly tell what the students wanted to hear. He told about theory and they wanted practice. And uh, what happened then was <laughs> That the uh, lady students, the young young women, sat there one day bare-breasted in the audience of the professor. Uh, sent the what? They said there, the lady students said they bare-breasted, bare-breasted, because they didn't want. I'm to not hear hearing this. But we what what do did the ladies do? Think out. It's not only thought, but they wanted action. That's it, it's still going on in Frankfurt. It's, it's I'm all not sure again. The reason this in, uh, intrigues me is yeah. uh, your claim that it had a tremendous effect on labor Zionism, yeah. and by the way, I believe it. Uh, but what you're saying now is really broad. All right. Um, how did Herbert Marcuse affect labor Zionism? Let's let's go into this stuff now. Yeah, how did let, he? Let, let us see. How did he affect core, it? The core of the Frankfurt School. All that's it's built around Marxism. It's built around socialism. That's that's the main theme there. And even the actions in 1960, in the 1960s, it was all about bringing socialism to Germany, to Frankfurt, make it real there. I, I'm, I'm with you. Okay. I still don't understand how that affected labor Zionism and the founding of Israel. Now, before it was the philosophy upon which labor Zionism was built upon. It, there would not have been labor Zionism without, let's, let's start with the beginning, without Marx, without Engels, and later without the Frankfurt School. Marx and Engels only told a way, but uh, the Frankfurt School tells you why you need to go that way and how to do it exactly in details. Uh, let's be more specific. What did, let's say, Ben Gurion or Weizmann, it doesn't matter, the leaders of labor Zionism, you're saying essentially they were guided by the Frankfurt, by Frankfurt, uh, Frankfurt. by Marcuse. Frankfurt, Frankfurt delivered, Frankfurt delivered the plans what to do. 
they did not tell you that it's about labor, that it's about socialism, that it's about Marxism, but it was all around that. It was all built around that. You know, it's it's the back door to Marxism and to socialism. All right, so, you're not helping me a lot. Oh. I'd like to be more specific. You're making major claims here. Um, yeah. You're, well, I'll, I'll quote you. What the labor Zionism would not have, without Herbert Marcuse and Max Horkheimer, labor yeah. Zionism would have looked much different. How? How did they affect labor Zionism to the point they wouldn't be the same movement without Marcuse? Yeah, now, no, these are the main which educated generations of young people. They educated a lot of people and, and they directed the thoughts and the directions into which people have to think, especially the well-educated people. What did Marcuse teach? Let's get to the point here. How did he have an effect over, uh, well, if it's over a Jewish generation, he got rid of the non-left-wing Zionists, all right? I mean, they were just thrown out of the movement. The religious, what was done to them, <laughs> that was unspeakable. Their, 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 their land was absconded from them. Their, their, in short, if you weren't a, a, a labor Zionist, you really, really got screwed in Israel. Uh, just before and after the, st uh, the state was founded. That somehow came from Marcuse. I want to find out how. The change. No, Marcuse. Marcuse was... Uh, he was oh, a man. Stuck, aren't he was an educator of, of, of the young people. And, you know, when, when your father was... was Labor uh, worked all day long in in a factory, and you, as as his son, had the chance to study to go to university. You know, then you feel much better than your father was, and so was the change between the generations. And Marcuse used this point of educating the people to make them feel better than their fathers had been. And so they wanted to continue his way because it's I'm different. really That's trying, true. Martin. I'm really trying. Uh, what you're talking about? Um, all right. So you didn't have a university education. Your your kid did. It's so doing better. I don't see how that fits. All in all, it sounds great. You yeah. go to university, you get an education, you get a better job. Yeah. I mean, that's certainly the myth. It's not working out that way for everyone, that's for sure. But uh, once again, there was a movement in Palestine that was taken over by the left-wing labor Zionists, and they absolutely screwed the other Jews. They had no heart whatsoever. Uh, for those they viewed as opponents. I want to know if this Frankfurt School gave them the, I don't know, the philosophical basis to do stuff that no Jew would, in normal circumstances, do to his, at least his people. Yeah. No, you know, it was modern in them days because it was quite new to know such in Germany. It, it was based on Kabbalah and it was based on, on the doctrines of, of Tzedi Sabbatai. And Tzedi had a, a perverse Kabbalah. He turned yeah. it upside down. In Shabtai Tzvi's Kabbalah, the, there was no God, there was no morality, right was wrong. It, it's it, nah, nah. You got a problem here. If if you're saying that they followed Shabtai Tzvi's Kabbalah, there's no. 
I didn't say they followed, but they 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 taught it and brought it to the uh, to the audience of non Jews in Germany. You know, right in the days when Hitler stood at the doors to to take over Germany. You know, it, there had happened things before. And uh, Germany was in a quite unhappy condition, otherwise Hitler would never have uh, taken over. And in that time, in that time, was Kabbalah presented to German students in the Frankfurt School. No, if it was Shabtai's fees Kabbalah, it was not Kabbalah. Okay, maybe. I am not an expert it's in... It's not a maybe. I mean, this has been... Well, I've I'm researched this on pretty him. thoroughly. On it's him. not a maybe. Shabtai okay. Svi overturned Kabbalah and made good bad, bad good. Everything, oh my goodness, oh, this is a subject. You know, I'm going to plug myself right now. I have a book called Shabtai Svi, Labor Zionism, and the Holocaust. Okay. It's a available at lulu.com that's www.lulu.com I I would actually suggest looking at it a bit there's a, a, a devious plot against Judaism uh, that took place and labor Zionism spread a kind of Kabbalah that was not Judaism I'm trying to get to the bottom of it, but we're not succeeding right here. You're generalizing, okay. but you're not succeeding. Now, see, what I can tell you is from the German perspective of uh, what happened there in the Frankfurt School, and uh, from, you know, in what had happened was in World War I, that's not a long time ago, before, before the Frankfurt School was founded, or was, was became great, became well known, there... Turkey was 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 destroyed, nearly destroyed. The Ottoman Empire was destroyed, and all the Turkish people were on the um, were disappointed. And Germany was one of the friends of Turkey, and uh, that's the country where Tsevi Sabatai tried to or or. or so Tsevi uh, lived in Gaza. The Ottomans uh, yeah. put up with him for a while, probably uh, with mm -hmm. um, co collaboration with the Vatican. It's a very long co story, but this movement spread worldwide. This okay, so out of it would nowhere. Be interesting to read your book on this. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, when yeah. you start looking, and by the way, my book isn't me. All right. I actually had a good friend in Rabbi Marvin Antelman. He guided me whether he knew it or not. Okay. Judaism was taken over, uh, really taken over by Shabtai Tzvi mm -hmm. and his movement. And in Turkey, you're right, the dawn took over the uh, Sabbatean movement. Oh, I'm not going to do this. I, that's All right, let's, let's try another tack. Who is Max Horkheimer? Max Horkheimer is uh, the leader of the uh, of the Institute of Social for Social Research, and uh, that that says a lot. The no, no, the name. we got it. And also, he spearheaded the Frankfurt School of Philosophy. Yeah. Uh, now, what influence did he have? on Judaism, on labor Zionism, on the works. What I know is that Max Horkheimer, he was, he was also a Jew, and um, now he was uh, thrown out from Hitler, or Hitler, he escaped to Switzerland. I mean, that, that's a nice fact, Halleck somewhere, but again, you're making claims here, and they're fascinating me, and I want to expand on them, but we're not expanding. What influence did he have on my life? He, he was not only a close friend, but also a, uh, a man who meant a lot to Herbert Marcuse. 
and Max Horkheimer had he he, he was the, the designer of the teaching which uh, Herbert Marcuse brought to America. It was the ideas which were born by Max Horkheimer. What ideas? Broadly, what ideas? The idea is how socialism can be established, can be brought to the people. How can the reality of socialism look like? All right, in a way, we're getting closer. The labor Zionists with their damn kibbutzim, uh, this was not a Jewish way of farming. All right, you took Jews who were professionals and turned them into farmers was not exactly uh, the, uh, the desired fate of the Jews. But we're, we're getting there, I guess. In short, socialism was foisted on all kinds of people, including the first Israelis, by this school in Frankfurt. No. No? May, may I go back to what you what you said a short time before? The Jews, the same thing happened to the Jews. What happened to France during the French Revolution? A lot things of of uh, farming was totally transformed by the French Revolution, and uh, I think maybe the same thing if I listen to your words, happened in Israel. People which had a profession were condemned to do farming, work labor in farming. The same thing had happened in France and they improved much on farming and on chicken raising and on, on, on animal raising and so on, on raising animals. Okay. A lot, a lot of things improved there. It was when, when Chiki a lot of things didn't improve. It's, it's a mixed bag here. The point yeah. is they were changed deliberately. The yeah. a deal was cut with the Nazis, the transfer agreement, where you get Jews for your new Palestine, your new Israel. Uh, it, I'm not going to go through this. It, it's heartbreaking for me to know it was done to my people and where they ended up. Uh, all right. Farming was a change. It got better at kibbutzim. I guess that's what you mean, right? Yeah, and, and people had to labor in farming for to be renewed in their minds to... Uh, it, it, it's kind of a punishment for them that they mm, are not allowed to continue the labor they are used to do, but uh, it's, it's re-education. It's a re-education program. You know, a uh, weird question. You have never volunteered for a kibbutz, have you? No. No. All right. The, the pressure, the mind control, uh, is that somehow how good you work is how good a person you are. Uh, somehow this works. People work harder just to be viewed well by their community. It's, it... All right. Yeah, we'll leave and, that be. And this may be one of the results of the labor of Max Horkheimer and of uh, Mark. Oh, oh, we have to take a short break. Boy, okay. we're just plugging and pulling here. I think we're getting somewhere. I mean, what the heck? I'm willing to try when we come back in three minutes after a few commercials. We'll try and understand where this labor, Zionism, and Israel, and ah, the works, Ben Grion, Ben Golda Meir, Weizmann, the works came from. And I think it's where you're talking about. We'll be back in ahead of the dominant media, FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net.
The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. Folks, it's Barry Chavish here. Well, we've got a new year, a Jewish new year, uh, about to come up. And I hope it's better than the last one. Boy, oh boy. Look, you get my books, and I think in this case, you want Shabtai Spiele, the Zionism of the Holocaust. You go to lulu.com, www.lulu.com. And you write in my last name in the search box, C-H-A-M-I-S-H. There's a, a side to Jewish history that, well, I'm trying to dig into tonight. My website, thank you, David, for keeping it up, is BarryChamish.com. Uh, Martin, plug yourself. How can people get a hold of you? Uh, they can... Reach me via email under G E underscore L A underscore S E N G L E at yahoo.com. You don't have a site? No, 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 no. Oh, I thought you did. All right, uh, then repeat that one more time to get a hold of you. You write. Okay, D E underscore L A underscore S E N G L E at yahoo dot com. All right, let's go back to this. Maybe we'll. I've been working on this for a long time now. Um, how the Jewish mentality overturned? Well, let's just say. Look, I'm going to give you a hint very quickly. And I've come to this this after much, much seeking 
I can't avoid this. If there wasn't an Israel, there really may not have been a Holocaust. And it, it gets, it's such a mixed up story. But I want to get to the bottom of this. Now, you mentioned uh, Hegel. What do Hegelian dialects have to do with labor Zionism? You claim they do. I claim they do, yeah, because Hegel's thesis and antithesis makes a synthesis. That's, what's this? That's, that, that's, that's a philosophy mix. class. That's a mix. That's the reality of it. It's a mix. It's, it's uh, you know, you wanted to, God wants to do one thing, man wants to do the other thing, and we finally... In the middle. We know this, but how did it affect Jewish thinking? Again, that led to possibly the Holocaust, but it certainly led to Israel. It led How to did it affect our, our thinking? It's, it's a philosophy of what man can do under the circumstances given, or how, what a society should look like under the circumstances given. All right. That's... That's what it's all about. Okay. Now, can we expand from there? How you create a nation? you got to help me. Come on. <laughs> there, is, there is identity. The identity is Jewish. And there is a philosophy which fits best that identity. And, you know, people love to to follow a philosophy, to make the philosophy an ism. And what we got finally is labor Zionism. It's an ism. Yeah? Well, so is Likud Zionism, and so is the uh, Agudat Zionism, the religious. I, I'm not following you. i got to be honest with you. You're talking philosophies that, by the way, I heard around my house when I was growing up. Nonetheless, I want to know where they fit. And you claim they fit. They fit in the creation. Look, what happened to my people with the rise of labor Zionism has been nothing short of disastrous. All right. I believe now, you've got to help me out. Where on earth did Hegel come into this? Now, Hegel was, was preparing the way for Marxism. That's what he really did. And without Hegel, there would not have been any Marxism. Because Hegel declared, until Hegel, you know, the country in which uh, Hegel grew up was a religious country. But Hegel declared man as the center part of it. It was not only humanism, but it was, it was uh, man in the center as a mix of good and evil. Oh, this is more and more Shabtai's feet. Now, if we do this in order, it's uncanny uh, how horribly similar that is uh, to Sabbatianism. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Who needs God? Uh, we'll take care of things, and basically having a good time is uh, is good, and uh, just go out and party. <laughs> this is what yeah. the Jewish people became. Well, yeah. unfortunately, an influential part of the Jewish people became. Yeah, that's 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 the truth. Yeah. It is, uh, you know, to replace God. That's what happened, what in fact happened. Philosophy right. replaced God. That's, that's what I think that really happened. All right, that's good. Uh, we're, we're melding slowly. Boy, it's not easy, <laughs> let me tell you. But we're melding. That, in fact, is uncannily like Sabbatianism. Yeah, yeah. 
All right, so the Hegelian dialect. Well, Shabtai Svi came first. Yeah. No, see, it's it's written in the Bible. It's in the very, very beginning. The Bible. A three, yeah, in in the in the book of in the books of Moses. The in the tree of in the garden of Eden was built was set a tree in the middle of it in the middle of the no, garden. No, 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 no. Sabbatianism and what you're talking about are direct opposites. All right, there's no focus on the Garden of Eden. There is a philosophy took over more than half of Judaism. The Jews of Europe more than half sold their goods, climbed mountains, and awaited God to transfer them to their new home in Israel. It's no. What you're talking about now is not what happened at all. I wanted to compare it to the tree of the knowledge of good. You're going to do it anyways, aren't you? Okay. The, you know, there are two things, and these are mixed up. And mixed, the mixture is neither good, but is always a part of evil. But it's never, never, never the ultimate very good thing. That's what happens there, in my opinion. Well, again, I don't see it, but I do see Hegelianism and Sabbatianism as a quite parallel. And that yeah. is mm -hmm. pretty solid from what we discussed. Now let's talk about Joseph Schumpeter's uh, creative destruction. Uh, this also you have as an influence on labor Zionism. How? How? Now, Schumpeter was the financer or had the idea how to finance things in this world. It was before Schumpeter was uh, founded the monster of Jekyll Island, but that alone couldn't move enough. Schumpeter created the thoughts behind it. And what were his thoughts? I can tell you. Um, there was a man whom Ben Bernanke still is. And Ben Bernanke is also called Helicopter Ben. Why is he called Helicopter Ben? Because one of his, uh, in one of his speeches he mentioned uh, when economy goes down, then I'll rise in my helicopter and throw down, drop, drop lots of money, buckets of money. People go buying with that money, go buy some things, and the shelves must be refilled in the shops, and the refillment of the shelves of, of the shelves uh, needs. Uh, I think I'm understanding you. In other words, you pump money into the economy money to keep an in economy going into economy or anywhere, anywhere. The helicopter means anywhere. You can pump money into anything. And the money is created the only artificially, just by pressing a button. It's on some bank account. Money is by pressing a button on a bank account and distributed from there. It's not not half of the money, not, not, not even small parts of the money are printed. Now, it's the creative destruction it. part was that you have to take away um, the belief in the head of the people that money is based on precious metal or is based on things like oil or on, on any value to compare to it, and any hard value, on any hard thing. So you have and, to destroy. And what did he decide that metals weren't worth anything? Uh, fill me in here. What is creative destruction? Creative destruction is the change in the heads of the people. You know, money. Then, then. The, Fiat money is based upon the belief of the people. And what people believe, the old faith has to be destroyed. 
in the money which was created by, let's say, by the, by the German Kaiser. He had uh, created money, metals, metal, gold, silver, copper, or had hardly printed money on paper. But this all has changed and Schumpeter brought it to the point that we need not even money on paper, we just create it. We just create enough money and nobody has to know where the money goes. So what he wanted to destroy was also the control over those which create the money. And that would lead to what? That would lead to what? That anything can be financed. Because money is just created by anything, let's say by the Fed. And uh, this money can be used for anything. And in the days of Schumpeter it was used to finance the CIA, for instance. Or to give money to Israel. Or to whatever, wherever some political heads want money to go. I'm not sure about giving money to Israel. All right, that, first of all, um, it, is also you know, very... There are heads which receive the money. There are people which receive the money. Whether it goes into the right channel to help the people, that's a different issue. Well, again, I'm trying to get to... I've always been, always, for the last 20 years anyways, have been trying to figure out how did my people get slaughtered like animals? Mm -hmm. How could that have happened? Now, I'm going to go to one more point you make. And you're talking about Alan and Foster Dulles having been at the Versailles Convention that guaranteed that World War II would be inevitable. That's a statement, and by the way, I don't disagree with that. But let's talk about that. Um, let's stick with my focus right now. How did Allen and Foster Dulles being at Versailles make World War II inevitable? And what for? Okay, Alan, what for? What for? Alan Foster Dulles became one of the early directors of the CFR. So he was one of the very heads, leading heads. In That's the Council on Foreign Relations, Council for on those foreign who don't know. Yeah, okay. That's Council on Foreign Relations. And together with his brother, Foster Dallas, he was a delegate at the Paris uh, Peace Conference after World War II, two, and there... Uh, one, World War One. World War One. I'm sorry. Yeah, after World War One. Yeah. Oh right. Okay. And he was a delegate at the to to design what later was known as the Treaty of Versailles. Right. And, uh, and you're saying it was a treaty that would guarantee the yes. next world war. Yes, because because it parted Germany into two parts. It parted Germany into two parts. There was, after the Treaty of Versailles made a border and create, it expanded a country, let's say, in the middle of, of, of uh, through Germany. The, well, the, this, this was Poland. This the country agreement was at Poland the end of World War II did the same thing. And it didn't start a uh, third world war. No, it, it started World War Two. It started. No, world I'm war II. talking the next treaty. Okay, Russia yeah. got East Germany, and the West got West Germany, and yeah. it didn't start World War Three. But, but the Germans feared that it would start World War Three. We had very, very close moments of this. For instance, when the border were closed, when the borders were closed, and Berlin, uh, uh, Berlin was was separated from nobody could could come to Berlin. So they there airlifted was, food. The airlift, uh, yes. The, the airlift. All right. Now let, let's get realistic here. All right, we're talking about 
uh, World War II that did break out. Now, how did the Treaty of Versailles make that inevitable? Come on, Martin, help Poland, me out here. Poland I'm not too well tonight. Was it found it so great that it separated Eastern Prussia from the rest of Germany? And I'm going to say the same thing again. The treaty at the end of World War II did the same thing, and it didn't break out in World War Three. Yeah. Okay. It was. I believe that uh, the World War Three didn't was not started yet because Russia was broke down. What I believe in myself is that after World War Two, we got the Cold War. It was a real war, and what I believe is that Russia has won the Cold War. Uh, was I, was that declared? That the Cold War declared as a war? No, it was not declared no, as a war. But that it was Russia won it. It was an arms race, and uh, Russia was far ahead of uh, America in this arms race. They had okay. first a Sputnik above in the air or above the air. We're not gonna we're not gonna make it on this point. Okay. All right. Israel couldn't have been created couldn't have been without events taking place in Europe. Uh, all right, I'm not diving into it. I spent a, many, many years, probably wasted my life, okay? The Jews don't believe me. They don't understand that their faith was taken over. And, all right, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm butting in now. All right, so in short, they divided Germany. That made World War II inevitable. Uh, kind of a flimsy point, but we'll, let's go with that. Now, I'm going to go with you. I'll be prepared to talk as a witness about the Stasi, that's the East German Communist Stasi. It's the intelligence agency of East Germany. Uh, well, what a claim you've got here. And by the way, I read the Rosenholz files. I had a look at them before the show. There's nothing in there that says that uh, it, they turned... Uh, Homeland Security and FEMA uh, uh, from, from, from Stasi models. I don't see where that's written. Okay. <laughs> uh, you read the Rosenholz files. It was uh, CDs. It was, uh, it was media. Has this anywhere been published? Or that what? How did you how did you get there? How did you get the Rosenholz files to read? That's uh, very interesting. You sent me examples and I read them. All right, mm -hmm. now let's just talk realistically. Who says that Stasi turned uh, uh, a philosophy I into oh. American Homeland Security and FEMA? Who says no, that? I, I say this because... All right, I, based on what? based on experience, based on experience. I have worked as a professional uh, and I lectured in the former, in the GDR, when it still was GDR, in the mid, uh, from the mid 1980s uh, to the 1990s and longer. And I was sent from Western Germany to East Germany to lecture in high schools, university, and so on. And there I got people which I have met, I got some business cards, and in the early 1990s, I asked how is this person doing or that person doing, people of which I have received business, business cards. And I was told, whether it was in the north or in the south or in the east or the west of East Germany, I was told, oh, they got a fine job in Colorado Springs. They have been hired and they could not neglect the job and offer. what did you infer by that? No, by that, <laughs> my that first idea Someone in America was, hired them. Uh, this right. or that. 
person wants to take my job because my boss was also living in Colorado Springs in that days, in them days. <laughs> and uh, I, my first idea was that the, the, one of these people wants to take will take my job. I, I wondered how hundreds, how thousands of people can take my job. That's that's impossible. I I didn't notice that it was to establish homeland security until oh, really the aftermath no, like of we're getting to the punchline now. You're yeah. saying they went to America with a purpose. Yeah, for sure, for sure. You know the Rosenholz files were said to be the names of Stasi officers, and it's still today. It's still today kept in an office in Berlin what uh, was sent back from America. It was uh, changed and, and uh, written over again and again. It's fake files which are now in Germany. It's not the, the very truth. It's not, it's not the very truth what's in there. And even the German president, Mr. Uh, Mr. Gau. Don't ask me his name. Yeah, no. Mr. I think Gau. it's a she. No, now it's a she. Yeah, now okay. it's a she it's office. But Mr. Gauck was before her, and it was uh, called Gauck Behörde in his days, and uh, he accepted some files. And I wonder if he did not recognize that what he was given from America was fake. But uh, finally, the CIA. What what happened was the CIA got the names of the Stasi officers from Russia. And uh, I'm doing my best here. Yeah. Why would Germany send agents to America? Not Germany, not Germany, not Germany. It was a deal between Russia and the CIA. Well, where are these Germany Germans in Colorado Springs? I'm lost. It was East now we talk about. Oh, I get you. I get you. Two interest I groups. get you. One interest is Russia. The other interest group is America, and I get the you. actors between it are the Stasi officers, and it was the names of the Stasi officers in them files. It was the same thing what happened in Operation Paperclip in the aftermath of World War Two. No, what that's right. the it same was, thing that it Catholics was the same were putting up. Uh, Nazis in their monasteries and Nazis shipping them off. Shipping them off, yes, and employing them to, uh, helping them to get employed. Oh, for the gosh. Uh, Martin, I'm sorry to say, actually, sorry. I think we were getting somewhere, uh, but our hour is up. Uh, Martin Delisango, thank you very much. I don't know if we got anywhere when I hear the show at libertyarchives.com. We'll decide. I think we did, as a matter of fact. Folks, i got to be back in seven minutes. This is very charming. And we've got another guest. Well, I'll surprise you. See you at seven, and thank you, Mark. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188.
I pledge allegiance to the King of kings and to his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. One holy nation and our heavenly Father, great mercy, justice for all. American Family News, I'm Rusty Key. Congress returns to work this week, facing a pile of unfinished business and looming deadlines. Correspondent Jerry Bodlander reports one issue tops the congressional to-do list when lawmakers return tomorrow from their summer break. The government runs out of money in three and a half weeks, so agreement on spending is the top priority, a goal made more difficult by the demands of many Republicans, including some running for president, that Planned Parenthood not get any more federal money. That raises the specter of a government shutdown, something GOP leaders will work hard to avoid. A Kentucky County clerk who refuses to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples based on her religious beliefs is now fighting to get out of jail. A judge last week found Rowan County clerk Kim Davis in contempt, and she's been behind bars since Thursday. Correspondent Adam Beam reports now she's asking a federal appeals court to reverse the ruling. It does indicate that they're not going to take this lying down, that they're actively trying to get her out. Uh, You know, they had a news conference on Friday from the jail parking lot where they said they have many legal options to pursue, including with habeas corpus. So I think we're seeing the first of what could be many legal moves attempting to get her out of jail. Microsoft will have a second chance to prove it's entitled to keep data stored overseas out of the hands of U.S. investigators when its lawyers appeal before a federal appeals court Wednesday. Julie Walker reports. The government has been trying to force Microsoft to turn over data stored in Ireland from an email account of someone linked to a drug trafficking investigation. Last year, the lower court ruled that the government, as well as law enforcement, has the right to that information. Microsoft already turned over the customer's address book, which was stored in the States, but argues the other data is not subject to U.S. law.